Mr. Beacon podcast is sponsored by Williot, scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth. Welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. It feels like the whole world is uh, imploding, but we're still here talking about uh, auto ID technology, IoT, and so I really appreciate your uh, spending some time with us. This week, I think, is going to be a very useful and interesting show. We're going to be talking about AIM, which is, uh, uh, well, let me ask our guest, uh, Sprague Ackley. Uh, can you, uh, um, Sprague, I should say, can you explain wh what is AIM? Right, so AIM is the, uh, the industry uh, group or, uh, uh, you know, uh, consortium of companies that is, uh, was put together in the early 80s to uh, expand the market for automatic identification. Uh, it started uh, where, uh, you know, a bunch of competitors got together and said, you know, hey, we're all, you know, printing and, and reading these barcodes. But, you know, the uh, the symbols that some of the people were making were slightly different than the ones other people were making. And we really should get together and, uh, you know, make some standards. So they literally invented the barcode symbology standard and formed AIM uh, to, to write these standards and to publish them. So the very first uh, barcode standards, particularly for code 39 and interleaf 205, were developed by uh, people in, uh, in the important barcode companies of the time and, and published as standards and then all the companies uh, you know, used the, these standards. And so suddenly we had all the equipment that was interoperable. And because those standards were put in the public domain, uh, which was very radical at the time, you know, the barcodes at the time, you'd go to company A and get their barcode, and then you'd be stuck buying all their equipment. Uh, and, and what we realized is, you know, it's much better to, to to own, say, 10% of a market that is a thousand times bigger than owning 100% of a tiny market. And that was a revolutionary idea that rocketed the barcode industry into uh, prominence. At the same time uh, that AIM was making standards for industrial applications, uh, you know, like the military and or hospitals or supply chain, stuff like that, uh, the uh, predecessor of GS1, it's called the Uniform Code Council, uh, put a barcode symbology called UPC in the public domain uh, for the same reasons. And so the, uh, the retail and the, and of course they, you know, our printers printed these uh, UPC codes, you know, for variable weight items in supermarkets and our scanners were used to scan them and the industry grew very very rapidly because it was all based on these public domain standards and so uh, as AIM grew uh, more symbologies were invented uh, and AIM was the clearinghouse for those standards and the uh, they set up a committee called the technical symbology committee which is still in place today as the premier technology group uh, in the in the whole barcode world and still to this day uh, we vet new technologies we uh, develop new standards uh, we answer technical questions you know from an industrial point of view and an aim has grown from just being you know a developer of standards to growing many areas of the uh, industry so there's lots of uh, groups that develop uh, you know application specific uh, implementations in the industry plus uh, aim is an advocate for uh, you know potentially communicating with the outside world like for instance if the FDA publishes some uh, you know rule and wants input you know from a non-biased source of information uh, they always come to aim that's pretty much everyone does as the source of information uh, for the barcode and RFID world but from an unbiased uh, perspective. So it's it's primarily barcodes and RFID. Anything else, or is that, uh, that the? Uh, 
you know, it these days it's it's everything uh, pertaining to, um, you know, I, I I call it automatic identification, but it's really you know much more than that. Um, you know, well, <laughs> your your company is developing a automatic identification technology that in, involves Bluetooth low energy to communicate. Uh, some, you know, silicon to uh, hold information and yeah, and sensors uh, to be in touch with the outside world. And this will greatly improve, you know, supply chain efficiency. And that's what AIM is all about. Uh, so we're technology agnostic. Uh, certainly from a market size perspective, barcode is gigantic. And it's so gigantic, people don't even realize it. It is a market, you know. It's just so uh, ubiquitous. Uh, excuse me. RFID, of course, is growing wildly, and uh, pretty much, you know, uh, blockchain technologies are all part of that. Um, and you know, how uh, essentially anything that improves the linking of the outside world to the computer is uh, what I would call, uh, you know, our bailiwick in AIM. So a fairly trivial question, but what's the M in AIM? So you have automatic, automatic identification and... Well, it started, the, <laughs> this is way too long a conversation for way too little of importance in my, in my mind, but <laughs> it started off as automatic identification manufacturers. And it uh -huh. had, uh, you know, all the barcode manufacturers together. And then RFID manufacturers came in. Uh, and then, you know, we had members from the user community joining. And then we had members from the academic community joining. Uh, and we thought, well, uh, you know, and we're much more than just, you know, manufacturers pushing one particular technology. We're also about empowering the workforce in the supply chain and, you know, we started to make these uh, handheld devices that were extremely powerful that could read barcodes and do computing. And so we changed our name to Automatic uh, in Information and Mobility or something like that. Anyway, and, and now, now it's... <laughs> so a, the mo mobility's in there somewhere. Yeah, mobility's in there. <laughs> and now uh, I think we changed it again to uh, um, Automatic Identification Matters. <laughs> okay. Which is uh, a little, you know, tongue twister in English for, you know, anything to do with automatic identification uh, is us. And, and of course, automatic identification is very important and that's why it matters. So uh, that's, I think that's the latest uh, name of the group. Uh, well, I, I, so we are just joined AIM, um, uh, which is probably why we're having this conversation. But um, I, I had been aware of, uh, uh, of the organization for a while, but you know now we're in production and we're starting to really think about certification standards, interoperability, and I'm like, man, we need to get with other people, and uh, so aim, you know, the, the relevance and the importance uh, uh, became very clear to me, and so I've been learning about it, and I'm I was thinking, wow, other people need to understand about this. So even though you're a uh, Kind of a well. Let's let's summarize what AIM is. So it's about standards. Uh, it's about human networking. Kind of meeting other people in the uh, in the ecosystem that we all operate in, because uh, we all need to collaborate and sell things and buy things. And, and, and not things. only collaborate for the current situation, but right. if there's anything I found out being in the industry for a while is. The people that are your competitors today may be, you know, your customers tomorrow and, yes. and uh, you know, and maybe your boss, <laughs> you know, the next day. Uh, so it's it's really important to uh, to work together. And, and I would have to say the thing that that I was told right at the beginning and I still am very, very uh, passionate about today is the purpose of AIM is to grow the whole industry and if the whole industry is growing and the whole industry is successful, you know, each individual company will grab their fair share. And by uh, working together so that customers are successful, if, if a it, it doesn't help if a customer 
you know, gets a competitive product and fails, they might come to you and you might get some short term business, but it's much better for everyone if, if customers are successful, even if it's your mm. competitor, because down the line, if the customer is really successful, they're going to need more equipment someday. And your competitor may merge with you, or may go out of business, and you may end up getting that business eventually. But if they were unsuccessful in the beginning and left in, you know, with bad taste in their mouth, it's not going to help you and it's not going to help them. So uh, AIM is there to make sure all customers, regardless of the uh, manufacturers that they go with or the consultants or academic input, everything, everything that involves their success uh, is what AIM is all about. And and that sort of segues to the other aspect of the mission, which is this education and evangelism, and uh, which I think is uh, is really helpful. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, in the old days, you know, and no one knew what a barcode was. There, there was a a lot of conferences, you know, to teach people what barcode was, and uh, you know, uh, what's that called? Horizontal, I think, where you know, we we had people from every from hospitals and 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 you know package carriers and and post office and everyone all coming to this concert what's barcode uh barcode is a pretty uh well known now even rfid which was the new oh wow thing uh you know 10 or 15 years ago is pretty well known now uh and so really what what aim has done is is helped uh vert what verticals you know meaning um areas that are using the technology uh, to, you know, come up with application support to make them more successful. Uh, as the technology becomes more commonplace, I mean, who would have thought, you know, when I started that every, like virtually every person on the face of the earth has the ability to scan a barcode in their pocket. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just unbelievable. And yeah. that, uh, you know, that kind of, power uh, can be harnessed through collaborating with, with an industry group, uh, you know, to help educate people in the various areas on how they can use that, uh, that power, uh, you know, basically to, um, to make sure that whatever their customer is doing is successful, whether it's getting that package on your front porch, you know, miraculously, uh, you know, three hours after you ordered it, uh, mm. to uh, making sure that the medication, you know, that the that the COVID vaccine you're getting in your arm has a complete cold chain pedigree all the way from its manufacturer to the point you're getting it, and it's mm. barcodes that are doing that, um, and in some cases RFID, uh, to making sure that uh, you know military deployments get the uh you know get the infrastructure and the uh uh and the, and the materials that they need to the right place at the right time and under horrifically difficult circumstances all of these technologies are completely integrated in automatic identification now it's no longer a you know oh wow what's this new thing it's you know how can we make it even better less expensive, um, more efficient, uh, and deployed uh, more broadly uh, for the benefit of everybody involved. So let's talk a bit about what the, how the organization is structured, because it's not just a monolithic group. There's, how, how, how is it, uh, how do the people work together? Is uh, there working groups or application committees or what? Yeah, that? sure. So, uh, so AIM uh, has a small staff. Uh, of three three folks uh, that you know basically keep things running, keep the finances going, keep the computers going, and then a you know a few consultants here and there for uh, you know particular uh, projects like you know when, when we changed the AIM logo, you know for instance, uh, mm -hmm. we made sure we did that all you know all well. But basically, it's all run by volunteers from the members. Uh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't get this. I, I don't know. I forget how many exactly what the total number of companies are uh, in AIM, but it's in the hundreds. And uh, and basically everyone who's a member of AIM uh, 
and and basically if you're a small company it's very inexpensive to join if you're, you're a huge company it's a it's a little bit more uh, so anybody that is a member of aim is free to join any one of the uh, many uh, committees one of which of course is the technical symbology committee and I personally would like to encourage anybody who is either already an AIM member or interested in joining AIM to dig down into their, uh, you know, the, their techie gurus that they all have inside their company and uh, let them join the TSC. One, it's a great experience for them to uh, interface with, uh, with all of my colleagues, who I have to say are un unbelievably smart and accomplished. And it's great for us to get new input, uh, you know, from people that have, you know, they're super smart, high, high tech folks with, with a different background. So that's, that's the, the, you know, the biggest uh, pitch I'm going to give is the technical symbology committee has been going, you know, since the beginning of AIM has a great history. Uh, we, we uh, elect a, a vice chair and a chair every year. So, uh, if you do join, you know, and you're on the committee for, you know, four or five years, you're probably going to get tapped uh, to help with the leadership, which isn't isn't that hard because we all pretty much, you know, work together. It's not like some boss, you know, commanding us. Uh, so that's that's a great uh, a great technical committee. Um, one of the, the committees I'm on uh, is called the IoT committee, and uh, that's been really fun. Uh, where that's in an application committee where we uh, try to, you know, garner all of the, you know, maybe the, the latest technology that all of us in the, our various companies are working on to help develop new applications for automatic identification that, you know, were just not possible before. And IoT, of course, links, um, you know, sensors of the outside world. Uh, it it marks things that are hard to mark, but marks them all so that they can be uh, tracked and become, you know, interact basically with the computer. Uh, and all the technologies, you know, that are potentially involved with um, the Internet of Things uh, is, is, is in the purview of that committee. Uh, so that's, that's been really, really fun. Uh, we have a track and, and i actually oh, didn't ahead. clarify what what is your role in aim what's uh, what's what's your job today and what what's it been in the past yeah so uh well when i started uh long ago you know it, it was always technical always the technical symbology committee uh was my role you know from the beginning uh however you know back in the day aim would have these these conferences uh called scan tech uh and that uh, in addition to just making the standards, we were encouraged to, uh, you know, give talks at these conferences. Uh, that led to, uh, you know, working with various universities to develop auto ID um, courses. And so I worked with that and ended up uh, helping to develop a, a kind of a teach the teachers organization uh, called the Teachers Institute which is still going on every uh, two or three years where we get uh, professors from all over the world to come and learn the, the latest about auto ID so they can go back to their universities uh, and either add, you know, a, you know, a, a segment to their course on supply chain logistics or their course on computer technology or whatever. And in some cases, some universities actually have a full on course dedicated to auto ID. So I'd, I've been doing a lot of work with education. Uh, hmm. And then uh, when Honeywell uh, bought Intermac, uh, I was asked to uh, be the representative on the board of directors for Honeywell. So I also I'm not the big business guy. I, I have to admit I'm not that enthusiastic about sitting in the meetings and arguing over how, how much money we should a lot to this thing and that thing and what the due structure should be and everything. <laughs> It wasn't really my thing, but, uh, you know, it gave me a really great view of, you know, the details, of how you run a business as AIM is essentially a business. We got to, you know, we got to uh, take in more money than we put out. So that was really a good learning experience for me. Uh, so I've pretty much done mostly everything uh, one way or another at AIM. Yeah, you can tell. Uh, but 
let's go back to the membership structure. So you join, and it's very affordable if you're a small company uh, and uh, reasonable if you're a large company. Um, it doesn't really have all these tiers of membership, does it? Or can, it, can anyone do anything? It's not like in the Bluetooth SIG, uh, which is a fine organization we're a member of, but there's definitely tiers, and you pay a lot more to get in the top tiers. And, uh, no, no. You, if you're the you know, uh, a small shop with you got three people working there and you're you're making one little product, you know, and your annual sales, you know, hit six hundred thousand dollars for the first time. You have just as much power and aim as, you know, the dude on the board of directors from the billion dollar company. Uh, so mm -hmm. it is a completely flat uh, organization from a membership standpoint. You can join any committee that you want. And really, your uh, only limitation is how much how much enthusiasm uh, you bring to the task. Um, you can come in literally as a brand new member, and and be making changes to technology standards. You know, the first week. So you mentioned the symbology committee, and uh, aren't barcodes done? Is there is there, there's more work to do? Uh, you know. Uh, Barcodes is that's kind of a human thing. Um, yeah, I would say, well, there was actually 20 years ago um, before the invention of QR code, actually, uh, a, a prominent in executive of a competitor uh, who shall not be named made the statement that everything that has is needed in the barcode world has been invented and there's going to be no more standards. We're not doing anything else. It's all done. Uh, and, you know, it, it could have been done, uh, the, you know, pretty much the barcodes that were around in the, in the early nineties, it, we did have a 2d barcode back then, which is called data matrix, uh, was, you know, slightly ahead of its time because we didn't have, you know, very affordable scanning technology. Now, of course, when you scan a, you know, a barcode with your phone, you're using a, a camera essentially, and that's what's necessary for these 2d barcodes, including data matrix. Uh, and, 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 an, and an upstart called QR code from Japan, uh, which now young people, when they you ask what a barcode is, it, it's a QR code. So, uh, you know, who would have known? <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's been a lot of uh, barcode symbologies invented uh, in, in recent times that have uh, gained widespread adoption. Hans Encode in uh, China is becoming a, an international standard. And just recently, a color barcode from Germany called Jab Code is uh, is moving through the ISO process, and I could go on and on and on. Uh, so there, well, there's, of course, basically... uh, there's your own company as well, like Digimark. I, I mean, I don't know whether you, that can be considered a barcode, but it's certainly an optical. <laughs> no, it's a barcode. Encoding. It's just a barcode. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, Digimark, you know, which is basically my my current company, is uh, the inventor of a truly amazing barcode uh, you know every barcode that you know you're familiar with and everyone on, on watching this call is familiar with is like a particular little place you know it might be uh maybe you can see is a the, you know the the upc code on the on the back yeah. of a you know item uh to uh oh, i'm working on this uh, i happen to have one here you know to a uh you know a typical barcode that everyone he gets uh you know, at home, and all, this is the data matrix mm -hmm. here, and you know, mm -hmm. code one twenty eight there. Um, you, these things, uh, you know, require uh, cameras to be read, and their cameras are everywhere now. And every barcode scanner out there today uh, scans this new barcode called Digimark. Um, and what's different about it is instead of being in a small fixed space, Digimark barcode is actually use the same technology as RFID, spread spectrum technology, and it's all over. So uh, so one form of the barcode is like looks like little dots. It looks like you're looking at the stars at night. And it's just tiny little dots. And you can hardly even you don't even know it's there basically. Um, but you know you can take any little piece of that you know whole surface and read it. Uh, so it's in, incredible in the face of damage and um, has lots of error correction, way, way more than regular barcodes. 
Oh, and I could go on and on and on and on, but I promised yeah. I wouldn't. But we'll you have let, a whole you show threw about me the Digimon. softball we'll question, so that's Digimon, your fault on is, it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah little, Digimark little, little. is a new barcode. And the tr thing about every barcode uh, is that every barcode is invented, fills some uh, area that wasn't being uh, supported by the existing barcodes. So um, when I said it was like a human thing, humans, when they're faced with a challenge, come up with something new. And so that's why we have uh, a lot of barcodes. I, I, you know, I would say that, you know, the main standardized barcodes is probably at least 15 or 20. And there's another 15 or 20 that are in, you know, it's common use that are in every barcode scanner. And there's probably another 50, you know, that those of us who are history buffs, you know, you know, they basically never made it to prime time. Uh, but all, all the barcodes that are there, when you buy a barcode scanner from any one of the manufacturers, you have a lot of options. Uh, and so you can pick the one that is the most efficient for your application. And if you're already doing something, you know, in an application that has a barcode, you can be sure that no matter what scanner manufacturer you go with, they're all going to be able to read that barcode because it's, that's what standards are all about. Very cool. So uh, we only got a few minutes late left, and I want to get through all of the uh, the groups that are working, and also just uh, uh, tweezer apart the relationship between the organization um, AIM and all these other affiliated organizations like ISO and Rain and stuff. So let's rattle through the other groups. So right. So another one. We talked one, about uh, symbology. We yeah. talked about IoT. We talked about IoT. Um, uh, we have a track and trace group for. Uh, that is developing uh, white papers and in helping people with the application of uh, one of the biggest ones is fresh, fresh food and cold chain, which I, I alluded to earlier on. Uh, that's a huge one. It basically involves serialization, uh, which is very powerful. Uh, then we have the RFID experts group, which has been around almost 20 years for helping uh, people with the applications of R RFID. You mentioned rain. Uh, Rain is uh, a you know basically a buddy a buddy of AIM uh, and anyone that joins AIM gets a huge discount in uh, membership fees for Rain. So Rain is an RFID marketing organization uh, helping to push uh, applications of UHF technology. Uh, and and then, we actually have had their president on this show. So if someone yeah, Steve about Halliday Rain, just... has been with. He used to be an employee of AIM. He comes from the mag stripe world way back when. I'm probably embarrassing him by saying this, uh, but he worked with standards in mag stripe. And mag stripe is an RF is a AIM technology. You know, it's another auto oh. ID technology. Uh, Very cool. You know, uh, even older than barcode. Uh, and then there is uh, a, a completely separate group, which is ISO. So ISO takes the AIM standards and makes them international. And uh, AIM is involved with the the U.S. Technical Advisory Group or the U.S. TAG for ISO. So if you join AIM, you get a big discount on joining the U.S. TAG, which is then your route to a seat uh, on an ISO committee. And the ISO committee for barcode is called SC31, which is um, you know the Automatic Identification uh, Subcommittee. And I am uh, on the uh, work group one, which is the barcode one. And then there's work group four, which is the RFID committee. And then we have work group eight, which is applications uh, of any type of automatic identification. But other than the discount, I, I thought that AIM actually had a role in kind of curating one of the inputs to the ISO process. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. Um, I think what you're referring to is um, the registration authority so uh, in RFID, there, is, uh, there are a couple of bits that are used in the UHF protocol uh, to allow uh, organizations to essentially issue numbers so that it maintains uniqueness. So one you know, that everyone is familiar with, uh, just GS1, which is you know, the folks that you know, make the barcodes on cereal boxes and a lot of other things. That in order for that to be unique in all the world, that has to be registered uh, as a uh, as an in, as an ISO acknowledged uh, organization, and and there's also uh, data 
uh, encoding in the RFID world that has to be registered. And AIM is a registration authority for those types of things. That's interesting. It wasn't actually what I was thinking of. So, but I remember watching this video with sock puppets um, that was explaining how you get a uh, um, an ISO standard started. And the message I took away was Steve Statler can't just decide I'm going to I've got an idea for an ISO standard and go to ISO, but but AIM can is kind of the, the thing. Uh, yeah, AIM saying. can yeah. or you can come to AIM and join right. uh, the U.S. tag. Or if you're in uh, Germany, uh, you would join DIN, D-I-N. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, if you're in Japan, you join JSA. Every uh, every country has, you know, their their national standards, which for us is ANSI, the ANSI standards in New York. And ANSI is basically our member organization to ISO, and AIM runs the group that feeds information into ANSI, which is gives us our uh, voice in ISO. Very good. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you about was GS1. Now, you touched on this earlier, but what's the relationship uh, other than the, I think, there's a discount that you can get to join GS1. but. I don't think there's a What's discount to join GS1. I, I can't speak for oh. GS1, but uh, okay. I don't think membership in AIM helps you or vice versa there. Sorry about that. But we, uh, okay. we are, have collaborated since the beginning. Uh, you know, GS1 comes to AIM when they want help with uh, the user community education. They want, uh, you know, they send their folks over to AIM when, so, well, who do I buy my scanners from? And go to AIM and AIM will give you you know, information on all the manufacturers um, so, and a lot of people, technical people and marketing people, a lot of people involved in AIM are also very much involved in GS1. GS1 is a user organization. So they, they're they made up of, of each individual country has its own um, member organization in that country. And then there's a global uh, GS1 organization and um, I, I, and a lot of people in GS1. GS1 is a member of AIM, and there's a lot of collaboration, you know, back and forth with GS1 and AIM. But it, but we have different roles. GS1 is you know sells numbers, and is their customers are like the big uh, manufacturers. You know, the, the, by far their biggest uh, area is of course you know retail. Uh, but they have a huge footprint in healthcare and many other industries, and and all of the people that you know get their numbers from GS1 also participate in uh, in G, you know making sure GS1 standards are adhered to, which is the data. You know I mentioned I was I worked a lot with data encoding, uh, so that's the data encoding side. Aim is we're the guys that like you know print and read the barcodes, or yeah. or encode oh, yeah. the RFID tags and make the chips or. Uh, or what yeah. have you. Uh, so that's the, uh, it's a collaborative uh, relationship, very long standing uh, collaborative relationship. Awesome. Well, I, yeah, a lot of our uh, listeners, viewers are um, solution designers, entrepreneurs, solution architects. And, uh, you know, it's one thing having an idea, but, you know, how do you actually bring it to life? And I think tapping into understanding the standards, understanding the ecosystem. Are essential, and I think AIM can really help with that. And so, uh, and even if you're uh, not a member, very much, uh, you don't even have to yeah. be a member. You, if you yeah. have questions about standards or anything that we've talked about here, get on the AIM website and ask them a question. And if it, I'll tell you, if it's a techie question, and the folks at AIM, you know, I mean, if it's something simple, you know, like what's a linear barcode, you know, they don't need to bother us. But if you come up with some question, you know, what you know, how do I increase the error correction level in data matrix, uh, you know, uh, or or something involved with, uh, you know, uh, I have a problem with my verifier failing my symbol because of modulation. I'll, you know, AIM will send the question uh, over to the people in the organization that can answer it. And you'll get an answer from AIM, not from a manufacturer. You'll get a, uh, you'll get a fair unbiased technical answer if it's a technical question if it's a marketing question you'll get fair information from all the all the manufacturers 
so feel free to interact with AIM as a non-member for any types of questions you have about the industry or standards or what have you. Wonderful. Sprague, thanks very much for giving up your time to tell us about all of this. It's been very fun and interesting. It has been and, fun. Uh, Thank you very much. And I have to say personally, uh, you know, I got to learn a lot about your technology and it's super exciting. Uh, and to whomever is out there, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't know, but uh, please feel free uh, to, uh, oh, you know, I'm, I should tell you what the website is here. What is it? Uh, aim, aim global. Aimglobal.org. A-I-M-G-L-O-B-A-L, one word, no spaces, no periods, dot org. And uh, that is the place for automatic identification information. Uh, and you're you know, welcome uh, to participate as much as you can. Sprague, thanks so much. And look forward to talking to you on another occasion about Digimon. Oh, that, that, I will very much look forward to that. That's some super exciting stuff there for sure. Thanks very much, Steve. Appreciate it. So, Sprague, are you uh, into music? Uh, you know, I, I've never, uh, I don't have the talent to play music. I used to joke, you know, I, I'm really good at playing uh, my stereo. Uh, so I really love listening to music, uh, for sure. It's, it's a huge part of my life. Yeah, same with me. I, uh, I have a guitar, which I uh, have occasionally tried to play, and it just frustrates me. But it does make me appreciate the people that can so who do you like listening to? What's, if you had to choose your, your three top records, what would they be? Uh, well, I like listening uh, to everything. Uh, you know, I listen to uh, mostly uh, rock music, but I, I love listening to classical and going to the symphony. I, I really miss uh, going to concerts in general, uh, for sure. Uh, but oh, particularly yeah. the symphony and, uh, and jazz and, you know, and I love, uh, you know, folk and uh and if if i'm having trouble pulling in radio uh on the on the east side i i even listen to uh country western stations uh you know anything that that has uh you know it's the sound i i just love the sound so if you you've got three tracks on your trip to mars uh what's the first one that you would choose yeah, well, obviously I could go uh, hot, totally highbrow, you know, and uh, you know, and pick something like the Saint Saul Symphony for organ. Uh, but uh, it, you know, I, I I grew up listening to uh, you know the radio, and one of my very first uh, experiences was uh, listening to the Beatles, and you know they made a huge impression on me, and and I'd have to say. Uh, you know, I love all their music, but uh, Yesterday is just a great ballad. Makes me think about uh, all the all the things uh, you know. Maybe I could have done better in the past. Um, and uh, plus, I, I I actually remember the words to that uh, mostly. I think uh, <laughs> yeah. so. I I'd say that that would be one. Um, and, and, I think and, that's one that he wrote in his sleep. Isn't that the one that Paul McCartney wrote? He kind of woke up and, uh, and just had it in his head. Wrote, <laughs> wrote it down and then uh, went back to sleep again. I, and then I haven't the heard, I he, haven't heard uh, of that story, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's so. certainly pretty simple. Uh, it's pretty simple, yeah. but very, you know, very powerful. And, and along those lines, uh, the, uh, you know, another great rock band from that time uh, that's still still putting out music today is the Rolling Stones and uh -huh. uh, a great anthem uh and and also one that I I, I also like the lesson uh, too is you can't always get what you want uh, uh -huh. which is you know very true in life but you know sometimes it's good to appreciate what you have and uh and I think for me I'm just I'm much happier uh appreciating the, the awesome things that, uh, you know, I have in my life, my family, um, great place that I'm lucky enough to be able to live. Uh, I've been super lucky in my career. And so uh, I guess, you know, that plus, uh, you know, many great memories of the thousands of times I've heard that song. Uh, and then finally, um, another one from that same period, 
uh, when I was a little kid, my parents, uh, um, sh you know, showed me a movie that they saw when they were a kid, uh, which is The Wizard of Oz and the great uh, ballad Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Uh, still uh -huh. chokes me up a little bit when I hear it, but what that makes me think about is the future and how, you know, there's there's always infinite possibilities for the future and um and that's just a a song that that you know inspires me to to dream and to imagine and to you know paint the picture for the future of where i want to go so that i can step into that picture and um so there you go those are my three songs Great. <laughs> pretty popular so well-known I... songs <laughs> I, I, lo I love all of them. And I think your what you just said is, I think, very typical of uh, technologists. Uh, you know, we uh, I don't know whether we all tend to be ha glass half full, but we, we see how things could be with this new stuff. And uh, uh, I think you kind of captured that in that uh, in that song choice. So let's just talk a bit about your uh, I mean, so you live in uh, in Oregon now, don't you? Is it, is it? Would you say is it Portland or Beaverton? Because Digimark are in D Beaverton. Digimark's right? in Beaverton, yeah. uh, which is I don't know about ten or fifteen minute drive from my house here in in the, the city of uh, Portland. I'm in the city limits in the south end of uh, Portland, down by the river. It's called South Portland. And uh, growing up in the East Coast, though, I always think of it as the other Portland. Uh, I went to college in Maine yeah, yeah. and hung out in Portland a lot. Uh, but this one is the is the one where uh, you know we're close to the mountains, we're close to the ocean. Uh, we have you know very mild climate. It really never gets particularly cold or particularly hot, uh, and it's just a very pleasant place to live uh, all year round. And uh, just great. It's, it's the best. You can see a mountain. You can ski in about an hour and a half. You can be on the slopes. It's, uh, yeah, less than an hour. I could be skiing. And then, uh, you know, an hour later, I could be paddling on the river, uh, you know, right near my house. And then, you know, another hour to the in the other direction, I can be uh, surfing. So got to love that. So. So you ended up in a really nice place and you've had a really interesting career. You started off as a physicist. How did you get from being a physicist to dealing with auto ID technologies? Having studied physics and I, and I, and although I'm called a physicist a lot, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have a, a PhD, so I'm not technically a physicist, but I, I have a master's in physics and did a lot of research in that area. Um, well, I moved, uh, to Seattle from the East Coast right after graduate school uh, for all the reasons I just described. It's wonderful about Portland. It's equally wonderful about Seattle. And I, uh, I looked around for a job, you know, and uh, I saw this little company that made barcode stuff and I knew uh, barcode, you know, they use lasers and I knew a lot about, I know a lot about lasers and, uh, you know, how they uh -huh. work and all that stuff. and. Uh, so I figured uh, I'd be all ready for my interview. It turns out uh, they didn't ask me anything about lasers. Uh, they were really interested in uh, their manufacturing processes, particularly uh, on the West Coast. You know, there's lots of mechanical engineers, lots of electrical engineers, lots of engineers, and very few kind of generalists. Um, and so with a physics background, they asked me, well, you know, what can you do with physics? And I basically said, you know, like anything, I can do anything. And they had problems with uh, glues and plating and wire bonding uh, and uh, hardening, all these things that, you know, require magnetization, uh, that require, uh, you know, really understanding of the basic phenomenon in order to, uh, you know, fix the manufacturing problems they were having. And so they and hired me. This was me Intermec, on. right? This you, is Intermec. It you, used to be called Interface yeah. Mechanisms when I started, but this is Intermec. That's correct. And they made ah. little uh, uh, light. They call light pens. They they uh, or wands, and you, and you would you know scan them across the barcode. They made printers, uh, which are impact printers back then, form font impact printers. So, you know, one smack would would form a whole barcode character, you know, with a letter underneath it. 
And so the processes involved with making those industrial devices, basically electronic devices, uh, involved all the things I mentioned. And it was all a mess. And all the, you know, the electrical engineers would just try to add more capacitors or whatever. And the mechanical engineers just put clamps and on everything. And uh, re really took, you know, the understanding of the, uh, you know, the fundamental uh, physics of it and to make progress, in, which I did very, very, really quite quickly in a, in a couple of years. I had uh, solved all the manufacturing problems. And I went to my boss, uh, David Alle, who is uh, famous in the barcode world, uh, you know, and said, uh, you know, w what's the biggest problem the, com the company is facing? And he said, well, our biggest problem is we have, we make printers and people, you know, send them back because, you know, their, their scanner isn't working and when it's really was the scanner's fault. And, and we make scanners and they'd send the scanners back and say, you can't read my barcode when it was, you know, most often the, you know, once everything was holding together, it was the, it was the printing. And they had uh, verifiers at the time that were really not based on how uh, scanners worked. And so they would, they would pass, you know, horrible looking barcodes that didn't read at all. And they would fail beautiful barcodes that, uh, you know, read great. And so he said, this is our problem. And that got me into the technology of the company, whereas before I was involved in putting it together in, mm -hmm. in, he basically said, you know, what what do we need to do? And I said, well, we need to make, you know, basically a barcode scanner that is 10 times more accurate and repeatable than any scanner out there and any verifier out there. And we need to, uh, um, you know, be then that will you we will use that to analyze the barcode and that will be the definitive solution. And he just smiled and said, Okay. <laughs> Go do it. Amazing. So off I went and that led me into developing the uh, the method that uh, is used today to measure print quality and I got into the standards groups because of that to show them how this all worked and uh, I of course was a young whippersnapper at the time and learned a huge amount from the the, the great minds of the industry at the time and uh, been working you know, kind of outside the company on standards and symbologies and stuff to make the whole industry successful and then inside the company to make uh, my company successful, you know, generally with, you know, new ideas and inventions and, uh, you know, pushing the limits of the printing and the scanning capability. So Intimac became Honeywell or got bought by Honeywell, is that right? And yeah, so, so Intermac... Uh, uh, was really in either the leader of the industry in the early days and then uh, in, in the top, you know, uh, two or three companies pretty much throughout my career. And we were all, uh, you know, battling mightily for market share. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the standard side, we all met and, you know, made sure that everyone had a level playing field because we knew that We'd all do much better if we grew the industry, which we did. And, uh, yeah, so, I don't know, about six or eight years ago, uh, Honeywell was acquiring numbers, many small companies, and assembling them together uh, to form, you know, kind of a, a big uh, barcode company. And that's when they gobbled up Intermec. And have you got into RFID as well, or has that been more the barcode? Some no, uh, you know, it's another. I didn't mention uh, RFID, but uh, Intermec uh, bought the IBM uh, RFID technology, the UHF technology. I don't know, maybe when was that? The late '90s, somewhere in there. Yeah. So for 20 years, I've been uh, involved with RFID. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in the, uh, you know, the the chips and the uh, the, uh, you know, the RF. Uh, protocols and such. However, in graduate school, I did a, a huge amount of work in uh, um, in RF and uh, and even in some jobs I had working uh, in the two to four gigahertz range. So I'm pretty, pretty familiar with that whole area. Uh, but I did do a lot of uh, work in RFID with the 
data encoding. And that was kind of my expertise. And then also hanging around with RFID guys, we did a lot of co-inventing on some really cool things that sometimes blended the barcode and RFID technology together. So it was a really fun, really fun environment. Excellent. Well, very good. Great to chat with you about that. Uh, appreciate it.